the kind of the notes work to be put together. Um, the title for this sections would be background information. We kind of pull back the curtains and look at what is underneath what we're doing and uh, so that we just have some sort of foundation. Yes? So thinking about thinking. This is somewhat a lesson in logic, if you would, uh, a little dabble, shall we say. All right, let's start off with our first term, deductive structure. What is that? A deductive structure is from something we build something, right? So we're going to assume some things, and then we build on top of those a larger structure. That's kind of the idea behind geometry and behind a lot of different disciplines that you use. So here's a little image I drew. So say you accept A and B as being true thing. From them, we I see something a true thing. Put that together and create, say, F. And finally, I could also take, for example, B, I could put it together with D, and create something else called G. Right? So that's kind of the basis for geometry. We have different things when you do this. Number one, we have undefined terms. You remember the first day we started talking about points lines and planes. It's really hard to define them to you, but a point um, doesn't really have a good definition. These things are things that we just assume that they exist. Next, are assumed to be true. And finally, we have definitions. So then we build things. Definitions. And finally, we have theorems, and I'll talk about each of these more specifically as we move forward. One last thing about deductive structure, um, before I move forward, is that the basis idea is that if P is true, right, that's something, then Q is true from that, yeah? Sometimes the P is more than one thing, but kind of like I drew in that little diagram, but and you'll see examples of that today. All right. Postulates. A postulate is, uh, sorry about that. It is a, an accepted, an assumed, what is the rule, the word I was going for? We have to look it up real quick here. Apologies, people. Give me a moment. A postulate. It is an assumed but accepted. I don't know why I put a U there. Hmm. I would have said an assumed rule. Oh, I know, it's unproven. That's what it is. We don't prove it. Yeah? If two angles, you add them up, then guess what? You get a third angle. That's uh, called the angle addition postulate. And we have a few of them that we use from time to time. Definitions. What are definitions? Well, it's kind of weird to have a definition of the word definition, but it means what is the meaning of the idea. Yeah? And a very important thought here is that, here comes a rather big word, is that definitions are reversible. Uh, I'm debating whether that should be an I or an A, reversible. Spelled it right. Good deal. 
And what that means is that we can turn a definition around. So let's look at an example of what is a midpoint. You recall we defined it a little while ago and we said a midpoint is a point that divides a segment in half. So if I turn that around and say, here is a point, divides a segment in half. What is it? It's a midpoint. So both sides of this coin, yeah, here's one side of the coin, here's the other side of the coin, yeah? It doesn't matter which side you have, it always leads you to the other side. And there's no, there's nothing else you could confuse it with, all right? Next, conditional statements. This is the basis, the very bottom, I would say. Um, we have two ideas. The first thing is we call the P thing, and that's the hypothesis, and that's what we assume. Sorry, I pronounced that kind of funny, hypothesis. The Q part is the conclusion, and that is what we conclude. Yes, that's where we end up. That is our destination, so to speak. All right, cute little gif there. Now, the converse that we are going to speak of is not a shoe, nor is it a discussion. Okay? So some people say to converse or to wear a converse. Okay? That is not what we're talking about. If the conditional is if P then Q, then the converse would be if Q then P. So we turn a conditional around. We flip it on its head, so to speak. And the reason we bring that up is that because definitions are reversible, so you can reverse the order, right? If you're a midpoint, then you're a point that divides a segment in half. If you're a point that divides a segment in half, then you are a midpoint, all right? All right, theorems. The last thing, these are mathematical laws. And unfortunately, they can be proven. All right? We're going to have tons of these. Most of them will prove. Some of them, they won't be proven. Okay? Um, they're proven somewhere, very often in your textbook. Page 2. Theorems and postulates are not always reversible. Underline that word not. Hugely important. Um, meaning, so if a theorem says, if P then Q, then you can't necessarily flip it around. All right? Sometimes you can. Uh, we'll talk about those. We, we give them special names. Uh, here's a classic example, the rat, right? The right angle theorem. If you have two right angles, then they're congruent. Now, if I have two congruent angles, then you have two right angles. Well, we can clearly see that this last statement is false. This is not true because you can be other measurements, right? So this is a, a scenario where the converse is false. The regular conditional is true and it can be proven to be true and we did. All right. The declarative sentence and the conditional form. The declarative sentence is just an English sentence. And it declares something to be true. I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. The conditional form is to rewrite it in this hypothesis conclusion form. 
all right? And so we call that form if p then q, yeah? And the hypothesis is the p, the conclusion is the q part. And these are like the flags that tell us what those things are. So an example, two straight angles are right angles, yes? So there's an English sentence. Notice there's no if and then in there. It's a declarative statement. So, if two right angles, oop, no, 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 sorry, not right. If two straight angles, then they're congruent. All right, so there it is written out in symbols, sort of, kind of a shorthand notation. And there we have the P, or the hypothesis, and the conclusion. And again, this one too, you can't reverse it, right? All right, negation. Uh, this is another form of a condition, yeah? So this is a type of a condition. Only in this condition, instead of having P then Q, what we've done is, because we use that word negate, we're doing not P, not Q. Okay? So, and the not symbol is that little tilde that we put in front. In math, we use a negative sign with the numbers, but when we're talking about a logical form in front of the statement, we put a not symbol. All right, and an example might be, well, if it rains, plants grow. And then the conditional would be, if, it, if there is no rain, then there is no growing. All right, and again, I wrote that last not in a, a sentence, but rather just as a symbolic form, kind of, okay? All right. Now, don't, uh, I'm going to remind you of some other things. Again, the converse was if Q, then P, right? Um, and the inverse, this is now a new one. The inverse is not get this right. Not, no. Oh, not P, then not Q. Okay, so that's the negation of the conditional. I should have, by the way, only done that for negation. Okay, that is the negation of the statement there. The contrapositive now is when you put both of these ideas together. That is, first of all, you put the converse down, so you flip them around, and then you put the negation on as well. All right, I'll go through an example of uh, using all of those together in just a moment. And my example is going to be a statement that Kenny lives in Cambridge, Minnesota. Right? Then they live in Minnesota. And by the way, we don't want to confuse this Cambridge with other Cambridges, okay? So when I say Kenny lives in Cambridge, we mean the one that is in Isanti. All right, so here is a map of the world, okay? We're going to call this, we typically put a U out here referring to the universe. And this has the universe of all the places in the world and all the places in the whole universe. Now I'm going to draw a pretty big picture of Minnesota. We know Minnesota's not round, but this is the collection, right, of all the places in Minnesota. And then we have here Cambridge. I'll put that with a C. And then here we have Kenny and all the people that live in Cambridge, right? All right. So if Kenny lives in Cambridge, then they live in Minnesota. Now, if I look at the converse of that statement. 
So we flip it around. And I say, let me put it as, as an example up here. So if Minnesota, and again, what we mean is if we live in Minnesota, then Kenny lives in Cambridge. So Kenny is in Cambridge. I should probably put in Cambridge. And we'll abbreviate Cambridge. Yeah. Well, if Kenny lives in Minnesota, must he live in Cambridge? Uh, clearly, uh, in this case here, Kenny could live out here as well. And that would be false. Right? So this is not true. By the way, all we need is one condition, one example to prove that something is not true. All right. Next, inverse. Well, what if I said if Kenny does not live in Cambridge, right? Then does Kenny not live? in Minnesota. Well, let's look at the map to see if that's true or not. Right? So Kenny doesn't live in Cambridge. Right? Then let's erase him from there. Right? He let's say Kenny's there. Well then he would be in Minnesota and that would make the statement false. Right? But Kenny could also be out here. All right. So again, we found an example of Kenny not living in Cambridge, but then Kenny is in Minnesota. Right? Now again, all we need is one example. So, I found my counterexample, so that would be not true. And most of the time, your what we call the converse and the inverse are not true. When you reverse those things around. Now the contrapositive. If Kenny does not live, I uh, should use that not symbol, in Minnesota, yeah, because I don't need the parentheses, then he doesn't, Kenny doesn't live in, in Cambridge. And that is patently true, because no matter where you put Kenny, right, if he is not in Minnesota, then he could be out here, right? And that's the only place he could be, right? He definitely cannot be in Cambridge. So this last statement, which is called the contrapositive, went kind of fast there, sorry, is true. All right? So there's a little Venn diagram uh, showing that. And again, you want to write this out in front of each one. This one is typically false if your first statement is true and then the contrapositive is true. So this idea here at the very end ends up getting a name. And we don't use it that much. I'm going to give it a name because it does show up now and again that it's called the contrapositive rule. A uh, book calls it Theorem 3. What a horrible name to give something. So I'm going to cross that off. And I'm going to say, if the conditional is true, yes, then the contrapositive, right? So not Q, then not P. Notice how I put conditionals inside of conditionals. Kind of weird, huh? then the contrapositive is also true. All right, so here we have the conditional, and here we have the contrapositive. All right, finally, the rule of syllogism. It is also referred to in our book as the chain of reasoning. This is one that you actually have used before. And you might know it by different names than what I named it by. Um, chain of reasoning, I don't 
really care for that um, rule. Uh, I, this is probably a, a better one, though I'll give you a, another option here in case you've heard this. If you have a statement that says if p then q, and we know something else like if q then r, right? then we can, can conclude that if you begin with p, you must end up with r. And that's because Q is shared by both of these conditionals, right? It ends up in the conclusion of the first one, and it's a hypothesis of the second one. So an example of that would be um, all cars have wheels, right? So if I say, um, I'm not going to say it as if, let's erase that. Let's just start with all. Okay? All cars have wheels. So if you are a car, you have wheel, wheels. Mr. Larson has a car. It's kind of a used car. It's old car. Um, then we can conclude that, again, here we have the P, Q, Q, then R. So we would say Mr. Larson has wheels. Yeah? All right. So this is called the rule of syllogism. There are people who sometimes call it the, the, the transitive rule, and I would suggest you write that out. Um, I do take that as, as, a, as an example of that, even though technically it's not. The transitive rule is something else, but we're going to run across this transitive. You might have seen it in algebra, and it's a good, good way to remember that one. All right. Well, there we are. That was the notes. Hopefully it wasn't too painful. We went through these four elements of our background structure and ended up looking also at some logical statements, including the inverse, the converse, and the contrapositive. Best of luck as you do your problems.